Kimball kind of mocked Rogers for even talking about wanting to see this list. You know, maybe maybe make it kind of seem like he was some kind of conspiracy theorist. I'm sure Rogers has been, has been mocked by the mainstream media before. He doesn't really go along with the uh, the narrative that they have. Obviously, not being vaccinated, he's gotten a lot of flack for that. Now. Kimball did not respond in kind to this. Uh, he threatened legal action, said it was a very reckless thing. Uh, but obviously, we haven't seen who's on the list, of course. So this sounds like a joke gone bad, and Kimmel didn't take it too well. Even though Kimmel is supposed to be a political comedian himself, he frequently joking about Trump and other conservatives. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's a, I'm sure it's obviously it would be a big deal. I mean, you if you're rumored to be on this list, obviously for your reputation, it's a pretty big deal. He did not take kindly to it, though, no. I mean, it certainly seemed like on the Pat McAfee show they were joking around about it. I don't know how much Rogers really jokes around about that stuff, though. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure, it's a, I'm sure it's a pretty serious thing to some people, for sure. Thank you, Dave, for bringing us up to date on that. Yeah, no problem, Dave. And that's all we've got for you tonight. We would like you to join us again on NTD Tonight every weekday at 9 p.m. I'm David Zhang. Have a wonderful evening. I will, I will give you a second to press the record button on your remote because you're going to want to save this story. Police say an intruder broke into a Rochester woman's home late last night. Now, the woman lives alone, admits she was scared. But as Andrew Banis explains, the intruder quickly learned he was no match for the 82-year-old inside. A crowd gathered around 82-year-old Willie Murphy at the Maplewood YMCA today. All of them captivated as Murphy shares the story of what she experienced Thursday night. A man knocked on the door to her home. He was outside saying, please call an ambulance because I'm sick, I'm sick. Murphy said she called police but didn't let the man inside. Suddenly, I hear a loud noise and I'm saying to myself, what the heck is that? The young man is in my home. Broke the door. She tried not to panic. After all, she spends most of her days doing this. <laughs> An award-winning weightlifter who just won a competition earlier this year. I'm alone and I'm old, but guess what? I'm tough. She says she grabbed a nearby table. I took that table and I went to working on him. And guess what? The table broke. The man fell to the floor. And when he's down, I'm jumping on him. Ah. Uh, uh. When officers arrived minutes later, it wasn't Murphy who needed medical attention. He's laying down already because I had really did a number on that man. The suspect, who police say was intoxicated, was taken to the hospital. Murphy is not pressing charges. Today, she's cheered on by her friends at the gym. Some even taking selfies with her. Ray John Sells says he hopes the suspect learned a lesson. She is the wrong person to mess with. Jim Marin has been friends with her for over a decade. He's not surprised Murphy held her own. I probably weigh close to twice as much as her. I wouldn't want to tango with her. Don't mess with Willie. <laughs> Don, I wouldn't I mess with her. That's I, for love sure. it. I love it. I for the love record, it. she told me she can deadlift yeah. 225 pounds, which is a lot more than yeah. me. Uh, and she hopes her story will inspire others of all ages. Yeah. Did, I, did you do a little arm wrestling with her? Did uh, I did not want to embarrass myself because I surely <laughs> would have. And she just likes to work out. Does she say she just wants to keep in shape? Yeah, that's it? it. She just wants to be healthy. Yeah. It's a passion of hers. And uh, she continues to go. She's been going there for almost a decade to that YMCA almost every single day. She's very well known there. <laughs> All right, gotta love it. All right, if you didn't roll your... As well. Why don't you focus on the... The Homeland Security says the impeaching... For sure. ...take a jar of America's over here. Because downplay concerns... ...that he called from the apartments. ...battled hard and fast. ...the has a resignation at six months or tenure. The move comes after a tumultuous following Gay's testimony to about campus anti-Semitism. ...is calling for the genocide of Jews. ...late Harvard's rules of bullying and... ...yes... Depending Gay soon came oh, under gee. pressure to resign from Jewish the universal and as some donor ended or withdrew. 
Harmon billionaire investor Ackman Rooks was personally aware than a billion dollars of the donation from <coughs> Rupert's most generous and more than 70 lawmakers signed a letter at Harmon letter altering of the Unipen and T's president Sally Cornbluth both who testified at the same congressional hearings oh, so a definitive yes or no answer whether calling for that is with our school's conduct really and prism again days after phase shizen on at two last month harvard's alumni association executive committee said it unanimously and unequivocally supported the president but on another front, a House committee widened its probe into anti-Semitism at Harvard to include an investigation into plagiarism in Gay's academic writing. <laughs> Most widespread criticism after the plagiarism accusations emerged, including multiple instances of missing quotation marks and citations. Jacob Miller, Harvard student and Hillel president, said Gay stepping down is just the first step. For me, the most important issue has been the anti-Semitism we've been seeing on a nearly daily basis across the school. In her resignation letter, Gay said, quote, It has been distressing to have doubt cast on my commitments to confronting hate and to upholding scholarly rigor, and frightening to be subjected to personal attacks and threats fueled by racial animus. Harvard Corporation defended Gay and said they accepted her resignation with sorrow. The corporation, which is the university's governing body, said she showed remarkable resilience in the face of deeply personal and sustained attacks. Although Gay has personal been as president, and sustained. she at Harvard, returning well, to position on the What about all the Jewish students? Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Dozens of allegations of plagiarism. Harvard's board for weeks had defended Gay against those accusations. The board has also supported gay Doesn't and deserve that money. Semitism in front of Congress last month. It's unclear what Gay's position will be following her resignation. Provost Alan Garner says he will serve as Harvard's interim president. That's why education costs so much. Is senior counsel the Walker Project. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Gerard, what difference will the resignation of Claudine Gay make to anti-Semitism at Harvard University? Well, the resignation is a step in the right direction. It shows that this is now an opportunity for a new leader to properly address the anti-Semitism we've seen, including the calls for the genocide of the Jewish people. However, hatred against Jews remains systemic. Harvard Corporation did not fire her. She was allowed to resign, and even when she resigned, she tried to inject racism into it instead of addressing the very racism that she allowed to continue on campus while she was president. So there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, now Gay is said to remain employed at Harvard with a salary uh, comparable to her almost $900,000. What does that say about her future role and influence at the university? It suggests that she will have continued influence in the years to come. It is a little outrageous that she continues to be paid at that high level. In the corporate world, we would call that a golden parachute. She is essentially being uh, paid off to, to resign uh, and not facing any, any significant consequences for her failure to uphold the civil rights of Jewish students. So the salary is an issue that she is being paid so much. The question remains why, and these are questions that the Harvard Corporation needs to answer. Yeah, and about the Harvard Cor Corporation, Harvard's board has uh, stuck with Gay this whole time. Uh, now there's talk of shaking up the board. Uh, what impact could that have on anti-Semitism at Harvard like we're talking about here? <laughs> that may very well have a positive impact. Harvard has had issues with racism and anti-Semitism for many, many years, for decades, in fact. It's only recently started to come to, to terms and atone for its anti-Black racism. I think that changing the corporate makeup, changing the board, may jumpstart a process of healing for Jewish students as well and proper enforcement of their civil rights so they're no longer targeted on campus. You mentioned Harvard has had problems with anti-Semitism in the past. Can you just touch on that briefly, what has happened in the past?
five pages. Here it is right here. Donald Trump has been indicted. Somber day for the country. This all happened before President Trump's speech was over. The founder of the Oath Keepers Militia Group is headed to prison for more than 18 years. His lawyers didn't have this video. No. The, the video we're watching right now, his own lawyers did not have. There was a big question of what did the people do who actually did enter the building. This is where we picked it up with the security footage that is new. At this point, the story dramatically changes. The New Jersey man who assaulted a Capitol police officer on January 6th has been sentenced. So this was withheld. This was not shown to the defense. It could be considered exculpatory evidence. doesn't seem like what a lot of the media is showing. I think it's going to change narratives no matter what your political perspective is. Holocaust, and perhaps the worst part, is how the world's reacting. Disinformation, indifference, denial, and even support of the terrorists. Yes, Jonathan Feldstein, Jonathan Tobin, and Bradley Martin join us to discuss the truth of the war in Israel. Who are Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis, and what's their relationship with Iran? Tune in with NTD host Iris Town and our guest panel. That's a clearer picture of these global events. Saturday at 7 p.m. or Sunday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. What will we do to maintain our democracy? What are you doing? Threat to democracy and will that will make that theme of a speech to this Friday in Pennsylvania a day before the third anniversary of the January 6th incident. Meanwhile, former President Trump has also called Biden a threat to democracy and Trump has planned to hold rallies in Iowa this Saturday. And all this is unfolding as five people in Illinois today filed a formal objection trying to keep Trump off the ballot right there in that state. They again cited the 14th Amendment accusing Trump of ever participating in an insurrection, disqualifying him from being the president. The Trump's team meanwhile has maintained that January 6th was not an insurrection and then Trump was not a part of any insurrection at all, ever. Similar challenges, meanwhile, filed by voters themselves have faced free health care for illegal immigrants and what it means for American taxpayers. But the cost of illegal immigration for American taxpayers is not just on you know, paying for their health care. The amount they're estimating that illegal aliens are costing the United States is about half a trillion. And, uh, of course, that's currently, you know, uh, keep in mind people are mostly coming here right now for economic reasons. They're coming here to escape global warming, which is imaginary, but don't tell them that. And as they come here, of course, they're demanding all kinds of free handouts. Those free handouts are not free for us. They're free for them. American taxpayers foot the bill. And, of course, as you promise more things, and if people are coming here to get the free things, you can expect more people to come as you promise more free things. And, again, all of this is really just skyrocketing in cost. You might remember back in November 2023, folks, House Republicans released a report, and it was titled The Historic Dollar Costs of DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, His Open Border Policies. By the way, they're trying to impeach Mayorkas right now over this. And they say, well, guess how much Americans uh, could be paying for illegal immigrants? Well, the number for that is about $451 billion. American taxpayers are footing a $451 billion bill to pay for the free housing, free medical care, free everything else for all the illegal aliens wanting to come here for all the free stuff we're promising them. Here's what it says in the report. This is according to the House of Representatives Republican Interim Staff Report from November of 2023. You want to look it up? It's on page three. Let me show you. It says, every day, Millions of American taxpayer dollars are spent on costly, costs directly associated with illegal immigrant, immigration and the unprecedented crisis at the southern border, sorry, southwest border, sparked by Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas' policies. Only a small fraction is ever recouped from the taxes paid by illegal aliens, with the rest falling on the shoulders of American citizens and lawful residents. Mass illegal immigration accelerated by Mayorkas' open borders policy 
now represents a massive cost to the federal government and state governments alike, as well as the pocketbooks of private citizens and businesses. I would argue that federal government, state government, their money also comes from the pocketbooks of private citizens and businesses. It's not like the federal government, you know, works like a, like a job outside of something we pay for. It's not like state governments run businesses on the side. Maybe maybe they do. Maybe maybe human trafficking is a big thing now. Uh, but for the most part, they get all their money from private citizens and businesses. And the money they use, the very least, to pay for this stuff comes from private citizens and businesses. So it's all from that. The report continues stating. The range of costs inflicted by Mayorkas' border crisis cover everything from emergency medical care to increased demands on law enforcement to housing and shelter benefits for illegal aliens. Many additional costs involve devoting resources to many uses Americans would never think of. Who knows what we're paying for, folks. It says further in, the annual cost just goes to care for and house the unknown gotaways and illegal aliens who have been released into the country under Mayorkas' leadership. It says it could cost as much as an astounding $451 billion. Now, this is having a serious impact on American citizens, as you might suspect, especially in sanctuary cities, like right here in New York City, where I'm recording right now where New York City Mayor Eric Adams is actually saying it publicly. Let me show you what he's saying. Our residents are weary. Our residents are angry. Our residents are seeing the impact of the migrant and asylum seeker issue, how it is taken away uh, from the, the, res the resources that should go to the day-to-day -day services of running the city. Uh, we did not walk out uh, from D.C. with any level of optimism that anything is going to uh, drastically change. Uh, it, it is clear that for the time being, uh, this crisis is going to be carried by the cities. Um, here in New York City, as you know, uh, we had a very uh, painful November plan that we had to produce, and now we're looking forward or in the direction of how do we address the $7 billion budget deficit that we have to address in January. Now, look, facing this crisis, there are a few different solutions on the table. One of them being proposed by, you know, Chicago and New York is to make it so that, for example, the federal government pays for it because states are going bankrupt. And, of course, the federal government also gets its money from taxpayers and taxpayers in all these states have to pay to the federal government. So what if we just make the federal government pay for all of it? Now, what, what a solution. Make the taxpayers in all across the United States have an equitable approach to, sol to solving this for the taxpayers in states that don't have, for example, you know, sanctuary city laws can foot the bill for the states that do. That's what's being proposed by a lot of the blue states, especially, for example, Chicago and uh, New York. But folks... There are some other proposed solutions out there, and it may sound crazy, but one of them, as I mentioned, is to allow the states to actually enforce the law on immigration. What, what a concept. Enforce the law on immigration. Just the News says that a coalition of 26 state attorneys general is calling on the new U.S. Speaker of the House to pass a Florida-sponsored bill they would grant states the authority to enforce federal immigration law when the federal government refuses to do so. The AGs, led by Florida Attorney General Ashley Moody, sent a letter to Speaker Mike Johnson, again a Republican from Louisiana on Monday, and in it they called on Congress to pass U.S. Representative Bill Posey's bill. This is the Immigration Enforcement Partnership Act. And Posey, also a Republican from Florida, first filed the measure in 2022 and again in March of 2023. And this is what he said. He said, quote, on day one, President Joe Biden began intentionally dismantling our public safety immigration structure. It says here that the president and U.S. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas have, quote, outright ignored federal law. And we have uncovered numerous secret plans to allow for the mass release of unvetted and inadmissible migrants, she said. 
and referring to Florida's border-related lawsuits against the administration. Now, it says here that the administration's parole and mass release policies are, quote, not only in direct conflict with federal law, but it, also, but it has also put American safety in jeopardy. Now, briefly on that, of course, the federal government, under normal circumstances, is responsible for securing the border. And they found a lot of different loopholes to allow for things they can't normally do. Uh, one of them being, of course, the policy of having people apply for amnesty. And, uh, you know, after just gaming the amnesty system, they have to wait for their trial. They no longer have the Remain in Mexico program that, again, Trump made where if you apply for it, yeah, you can apply, but you're going to wait on the other side of the border so we don't have to foot the bill for you. And um, you know, is to secure the border and, you know, enforce the law on immigration. The Democrat states have other solutions, like, for example, make American taxpayers pay for it from the federal level. Or, you know, maybe just uh, find other ways to give people free housing. You're talking about this. Now, before I get into these other solutions, part two of our documentary, The Real Story of January 6th, we are releasing it. All right, I, will, I will give you a second to press the record button on your remote because you're going to want to save this story. Police say an intruder broke into a Rochester woman's home late last night. Now, the woman lives alone, admits she was scared. But as Andrew Banis explains, the intruder quickly learned he was no match for the 82-year-old inside. A crowd gathered around 82-year-old Willie Murphy at the Maplewood YMCA today. All of them captivated as Murphy shares the story of what she experienced Thursday night. A man knocked on the door to her home. He was outside saying, please call an ambulance because I'm sick, I'm sick. Murphy said she called police but didn't let the man inside. Suddenly... I hear a loud noise and I'm saying to myself, what the heck is that? The young man is in my home. Broke the door. She tried not to panic. After all, she spends most of her days doing this. <laughs> An award-winning weightlifter who just won a competition earlier this year. I'm alone and I'm old, but guess what? I'm tough. She says she grabbed a nearby table. I took that table and I went to working on him. And guess what? The table broke. The man fell to the floor. And when he's down, I'm jumping on him. Ah. Uh, uh. When officers arrived minutes later, it wasn't Murphy who needed medical attention. He's laying down already because I had really did a number on that man. The suspect, who police say was intoxicated, was taken to the hospital. Murphy is not pressing charges. Today, she's cheered on by her friends at the gym. Some even taking selfies with her. Ray John Sells says he hopes the suspect learned a lesson. She is the wrong person to mess with. Jim Marin has been friends with her for over a decade. He's not surprised Murphy held her own. I probably weigh close to twice as much as her. I wouldn't want to tango with her. Don't mess with Willie. <laughs> Don, I wouldn't I mess with her. That's I, for love sure. it. I love it. I for love the record, it. she told me she can deadlift yeah. 225 pounds, which is a lot more than yeah. me, uh, and she hopes her story will inspire others of all ages. Yeah. Did, I, did you do a little arm wrestling with her? Did uh, I did not want to embarrass myself, because <laughs> I surely would have. <laughs> and she just likes to work out, does she say? She just wants to keep in shape? Yeah, that's has... it. She just wants to be healthy. Yeah. It's a passion of hers, and uh, she continues to go. She's been going there for almost a decade to that YMCA almost every single day. She's very well known. <laughs> There. All right, gotta love it. All right, if you didn't roll your... Police cars could be seen parked outside the school, and the FBI is reportedly on scene as well. Today's the first day of school following the winter break. So far, no other information is available. Police are expected to provide updates later today. Tensions continue to escalate in the Middle East. The fallout of the war between Israel and Hamas is rocking the region. Iraq said earlier today that a U.S. airstrike hit a base of the popular mobilization front in Baghdad. In Iran lines. Four fighters were killed, including a commander of the group. Iraq security forces were deployed in response. An unnamed U.S. official told Reuters the U.S. Carries out this, carried out this airstrike because the commander was responsible for recent attacks on U.S. troops in the region. The militia has threatened to retaliate. In neighboring Iran, the regime is vowing revenge after at least 84 people were killed in the explosions during its memorial event on Wednesday. 
Iran blamed Israel for the attacks, saying they will pay a heavy price. No group has claimed responsibility so far. The U.S. and 12 allies issued what amounts to a... Local sea traffic by replacing long voyages around South America's Cape Horn. An estimated 20,000 workers died during French control of the project, many due to tropical diseases such as malaria. 5,600 more perished during U.S. construction. For 79 days, but failed to win any concessions. The movement inspired a new generation of political activists. But China has cracked down on free speech and political opposition in the former British colony. 20 years ago, some 230,000 people in Southern Asia were killed by a tsunami on December 26, 2004. The world's most powerful earthquake in 40 years beneath the Indian Ocean triggered the catastrophe. Apple launched its first Apple Macintosh computer 40 years ago on January 24, 1984. The Mac had a graphical user interface and was also cheaper and faster. It also marked the beginning of the company's large advertising campaigns. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. On carbide wafer, it starts to show semiconducting properties and can be turned on and off. The good thing about graphene is not only can you make things smaller and faster and uh, with less heat dissipation, you're actually using properties of electrons that are not accessible in silicon. So this is really a paradigm shift. Graphene is also compatible with conventional microelectronic processing methods, potentially changing the future of the devices we use every day. But we know we're opening a door in a major paradigm shift in doing electronics. Graphene is the next step. Who knows what the step's going to be after that, but there's a good chance that graphene can take over and be the paradigm for the next 50 years. The team's measurements showed that their semiconductor has 10 times greater mobility than silicon, meaning the electrons move with very low resistance, which translates to faster computing. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. In the face of threats from communist China, China's ruling communist party seized Taiwan as its own territory, despite never having ruled it. Polls show Lai as the frontrunner, ahead of candidates from opposition parties Kuomintang and the Taiwan People's Party. Compared to Lai, his competitor from the Kuomintang Party sees China differently. The KMT Party is known for its pro-China stance. Its vice presidential candidate said it would be hard to compete with China even if the island's defense budget got boosted to half of its national GDP, which would prove almost impossible. Reports say China has been pushing false information campaigns on the island in order to meddle in the election, while a Reuters report on Wednesday said no matter who sits in the president's office, pressure from the Chinese military won't let up. As voters prepare to make their choice, China's balloon technology is back in the spotlight. The West says the aircraft are used for spying. On Tuesday, Taiwan's defense ministry said it detected four balloons from China around the island. Three of them approached a key air force base. Beijing also sent four military aircraft and three warships near the Taiwan Strait. The former leader of a Hong Kong pro-democracy group reveals a troubling story. He says authorities paid him to be an informant. He unveiled the details after finding freedom in the West. Here's his story. Hong Kong activist Tony Chung said on Thursday he had fled to Britain and formally applied for political asylum. 22-year-old Chung is the former leader of the now-disbanded pro-independence group Student Localism. In a Facebook post on Thursday, he said that he'd been suffering from significant mental stress. Chung was sentenced to 43 months in prison in November 2021 for succession and money laundering. He was charged under the sweeping national security law which Beijing imposed on Hong Kong in 2020 after months of anti-Beijing pro-democracy protests. Chung himself was released in June 2023, but he says he has since been under police surveillance, the trauma of which made him leave. Chung told Reuters that after his release, Chinese officers offered him over $300 to become an informant. Chung said he accepted the offer because he felt he had no choice. Under their close monitoring, he believed authorities wanted to test him to see if he would cooperate. He added that he didn't give them any significant information. That's all for today's China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. If you have any feedback on the show or have something you'd like to see us cover, 
send us an email at chinainfocusntd.com. So-called maximum pressure campaign against Iran. The State Department says the threats against Pompeo and Hook remain serious and credible, which is why they continue to need government-provided security details. News of the renewed protection broke at around the same time the attack in Iran yesterday that killed around 100 people. The State Department had already notified Congress last month about the need for continued protection for Pompeo. Taiwan's presidential elections are nine days away, and the world is watching. The Democratic Progressive Party's candidate, Lai ching Tu who recognizes Taiwan's established sovereignty as a slight lead in recent polling. This while Chinese regime leader Xi Jinping ramping up his rhetoric on reunifying the democratic-ruled island with communist China. We spoke with Justin Logan of the Cato Institute about the implications of the election in an increasingly unstable Chinese regime. Justin Logan, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Thanks for having me. Of course, Justin, uh, Taiwan's presidential election is less than two weeks away. Implications quite significant, not only for Taiwan, but the rest of the world, really. Talk to us about the two candidates, what might change, and how it might impact not only the U.S., but the world. There's been considerable continuity on maybe the most important issue from the U.S. point of view, which is Taiwan's level of defense effort on its own part. Um, I think there's been a real focus on U.S.-China military competition, U.S.-China balancing behavior in and around Taiwan. But there are certain things that Taiwan has to do uh, for its own defense, uh, survive a potentially missile bombardment um, from China, should China make a play at Taiwan, um, and prevent China from developing a beachhead, right, where China could conceivably invade Taiwan. And we've seen pretty consistently uh, Taiwan's defense spending hover around or under 2% of GDP, close to 1% of GDP. And so I think that's been continuous among both uh, KMT and uh, DPP or now sort of the coalition candidates. So I think there's an increasing sense in Washington that there needs to be pressure applied to Taipei um, to lift that level of effort, both in terms of the overall quantity of effort um, and in focusing on asymmetric capabilities that can compound Chinese military planning. So I think there's been a sense that, um, to oversimplify, people in Washington sometimes say, well, the KMT is soft on China. Um, historically, the DPP, or now the coalition, has been uh, uh, had a more uh, tough on China posture. But I think for the things that matter from a U.S. point of view, there's been continuity, and so I think there's a growing realization that the United States needs to make that case forcefully to Taiwan. With regard to Xi Jinping, the dictator of China's recent uh, comments of, you know, inevitable reunification, if you will, with Taiwan, are the stakes raised a bit? What do you make of his most recent comments in his New Year address? Yeah, it is unnerving, and of course we heard the, the release that he said that directly to President Biden, of course, in their meeting that, uh, you know, the, the reunification of Taiwan with China was a sort of ineluctable reality. That's, that's uh, new and somewhat unnerving from the U.S. point of view, and certainly from the Taiwanese point of view. Um, so I think that, you know, it's been a real guessing game on the part of analysts in the United States, and some people are saying 2027 is the year, 2025 is the year. We, of course, had the memo uh, from an apparent Israeli strike near Beirut that killed a Hamas leader. On Thursday, Israel Defense Forces reported several launches coming from Lebanese territory. And in response, the IDF struck at the source of the launches and also struck a launch post and an observation post. This Israeli woman's home is just one mile away from Israel's border with Lebanon. She's currently living in a hotel in a safer area, but she decided to visit her home and get this message. It's, it's scary, I must say. And we need to be sure that we're safe in order to come and live here again in our homes. So this is our, our request for our government from our army. Please make us safe. And on Wednesday, Israel's chief of the general staff met with troops on the northern border to discuss the situation. Based on my impressions, we are in a very high state of readiness in the north. I think our readiness is at its peak. And he also mentioned the apparent lapse in Israeli security that allowed the October 7th attacks to happen. We are going to have more soldiers on the borders for at least the next year, and we will reach something much stronger. Because this event, as hard as it is, and we will talk about it a lot more, 
we could have known, we couldn't have known. It cannot repeat itself, that's for sure. And we need to provide a very, very strong response to this matter. And on Thursday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham. Netanyahu told him that Israel is committed to achieving its goals in the war. And for that, they'll apply maximum power and precision everywhere that's needed. And Graham responded by saying, we have your back. Jason Berry, NTD News.